Finding for Energy uh, Predictions in Amber. Thanks, Darren, and the time is yours. Thank you very much, and thanks everyone for uh, uh, attending the meeting. I'm very excited to, to be here to talk with everyone and listen to people's comments. Um, what I wanted to do today was uh, kind of give an overview of uh, some of the things that were going on in our efforts in developing uh, free energy methods within uh, the AMBER suite of programs and, and related packages that get sort of tacked on to AMBER that I'll talk to uh, in the course of this talk. So basically, I wanted to kind of divide this up into a, a couple pieces. One, to give a quick uh, update on uh, what's going on in Amber 20 in terms of validation of our GPU accelerated free energy methods and uh, some recent uh, sort of overhauling of, of soft core potentials uh, that we've done to sort of improve some of the alchemical transformations. Then I wanna talk a little bit about some add-ons to, to Amber 20 that we call Amber 20 Drug Discovery Boost which is available for beta testing. If anyone wants to contact me, you can get uh, get this right away if you have a, a current Amber 20 license because it's an add-on to, to Amber 20, but we're happy to, to entertain people to beta test the new methods that aren't available in Amber 20. So this includes things like new pairwise uh, smooth step software potentials for improved transformations and stability above, above and beyond uh, what's been recently published uh, by our group. Also looking at enhanced sampling methods, including Hamiltonian replicate exchange and NPT ensembles uh, and parallelized across uh, uh, multi-GPU nodes. Uh, then there's a bunch of emerging methods uh, in, the, in the drug discovery boost package, which include new and enhanced sampling methods that are kind of related to uh, uh, REST and REST2 uh, types of methods that I'll, I'll kind of talk about uh, at the end. Uh, also, new ways of analyzing entire networks of uh, free energy analysis, which include things like cycle, cycle closure constraints and also uh, arbitrary linear reference or experimental constraints, which sometimes improve predictions. Um, finally, I'll talk about uh, some of our recent work using quantum mechanical force fields and machine learning methods and how we wire that in uh, into the free energy pipeline in order to use uh, different force fields, which may be more expensive in a way that's uh, robust using a so-called bookending approach. Um, all right. So the overall kind of vision uh, of trying to get AMBER to be a, a useful um, tool for high throughput computational lead optimization is uh, is Thus, um, we use uh, the GPU accelerated MD engine within Amber as, uh, as our, our, our MD engine for performing simulations using uh, traditional uh, pairwise decomposable force fields. Uh, and we'll talk about how to improve from there using the bookending approaches. Uh, but from there, we have on, on one end, uh, robust uh, network free energy analysis toolkits uh, for analyzing entire sets of data with, with uh, constraints. Then we have an enhanced sampling methods that sort of build around AMBER. There's some internal enhanced sampling methods, but also external ones that, that use uh, uh, AMBER as an MB driver. Uh, and we also have auxiliary tools for performing so-called endpoint corrections or bookending corrections to be able to correct the, the free energy predictions using traditional force fields to other potentials, including machine learning potentials and, and quantum mechanical potentials. And so the idea is, uh, of course, with weed optimization that we have a whole compound library that we're trying to screen. Maybe some of the, the, the relatively binding free energies are known, maybe some of them are not. Uh, we use this kind of high performance pipeline and try and come up with some predictions as to which we think uh, might be the best binders. So that's the overall strategy that, uh, that I'll kind of talk about. So um, moving forward, uh, you know, what, what, what do I mean by this uh, AMBER drug discovery boost? Well, it's a set of independent packages that build on top of, of AMBER. Uh, so independent packages, but also patches to the latest uh, AMBER 20 code that enhance functionality and performance for drug discovery. Ultimately, these will be integrated into the AMBER release, or at least the ones that are most useful, but those only happen in two year cycles. So this is what's available right now to build on top of the current release in AMBER, which was just released a couple months ago. So this allows us to, to have a development pipeline for beta testing new methods and new features to be integrated into the next AMBER tools release. So this is our, our, our attempt to sort of engage in, in a broad academic and industry community uh, to be able to help inform and guide us as to what are the most useful things, uh, most useful methods that, that we can try and integrate into the AMBER development pipeline. Now, my group is not, uh, uh, doesn't receive any royalties or anything like that from AMBER. We are AMBER developers, but we don't get any, any of the revenue that comes in through, through, through AMBER sales. That's part of the AMBER executive committee. Um, but we're nonetheless building the, the GPU accelerated free energy tools within AMBER. 
Um, so uh, we're uh, happy to offer this as a, as kind of a, a, a beta testing thing or for production, as long as we're given feedback and, and things are done under the, the Amber 20 rules, which means you have to have an Amber 20 uh, uh, license. So if you're interested, uh, shoot me an email and I'm sure we can work something out. Um, okay, so real quick, uh, this is gonna go, go the overview part. I'm gonna talk about validation of free energy methods in Amber. So it turns out when we got our hands on the code a couple years ago, there were some issues with CPU code with respect to uh, having consistency in free energy predictions using different uh, alchemical pathways. Uh, I'll make a long story short, although there'll be some common themes I need to, to, to sort of slow down for. But essentially what we were sort of seeing is that prior to Amber 18, which is when we were really started working on the, on the free energy codes, or at least the GPU accelerated free energy codes in Amber, uh, there was a subtle error that was cropping up uh, involving um, transformations that would appear to be path independent uh, when you looked at, at differences between uh, legs, but were actually not uh, path independent on, on individual legs. So if you're looking at a delta G, you would get path dependent results. If you're looking at a delta delta G, oftentimes it seemed like those results were largely path independent. It turns out this was an error. I mean, uh, theoretically we know it's an error, but it was kind of hard to tell because we, could, we didn't have uh, the types of GPU accelerated codes that will allow us to get to the precision level to be sure. And so finally, when we did that, we realized, yeah, yeah, this is a problem and we looked into things a little bit further. And what you see here is a regression of, uh, of uh, free energy is predicted using a unified transformation uh, where everything is, is transformed uh, from one state to another kind of uh, along one pathway as opposed to a decoupled or split uh, procedure or, con or, or, or a stepwise procedure where we first turn off electrostatics, then you take van der Waals terms, then turn on electrostatics. And these two things should give us exactly the same results and they don't. Um, so it turns out there was a subtle uh, uh, error uh, in, the, in the code that involved the, the interactions across the soft core common core boundary, uh, particularly involving one four terms, one four electrostatics and van der Waals terms, which were not being appropriately scaled by Lambda during the transformation. When this got fixed, uh, everything lined up fine. And as part of a validation paper that's recently appeared in, in uh, JCIM, uh, we did some other validation tests, uh, including looking at uh, systems like acetic acid. Now I'm going to use, here's where I'm going to slow down a little bit because I'm going to use acetic acid as an illustrative example. So it turns out that if you're looking for a delta delta G, this problem that was being observed in Amber with the one four terms didn't crop up if the ensembles generated from the molecule were essentially the same in the two environments being considered whether that was gas phase and in solution or solution versus in a, in a bound protein environment. If the, if the conformational ensembles were similar, the delta delta Gs, you wouldn't really notice much of a difference. So, so uh, as an illustrative example, acetic acid, which has been looked at by a lot of people, has definite clear uh, uh, preferences in terms of sort of the, the internal torsion angle associated with, uh, with the orientation of the proton, which is uh, uh, preferred to be in, in what I'll call a cis orientation in the gas phase, where it's kind of making an internal hydrogen bond with, uh, with one of the carboxylate oxygen, one of the, the carboxylic acid oxygens. And in solution, it prefers a trans form, uh, which has an enhanced dipole moment. Um, so if you look at the PMF profiles, what you should see uh, with the correct code is you should see a distinct uh, um, profile corresponding to the gas phase, uh, another distinct profile that's corresponding to the solution phase. And then in, in the, the, the state where the soft core region has been completely turned, out, turned off, the so-called dummy state, uh, where the soft core atoms have, have become dummy atoms, uh, then, then the, the ensembles in solution and in the gas phase should be exactly the same because that's the state where, where the, the, the ligand is not interacting with any of its environment, uh, including the, the soft core region. Um, what I want you to notice here is that even in the dummy state, there's actually a large barrier due to the internal torsion angle parameters associated with uh, uh, interconversion between cis and trans forms. And that's kind of come up a little bit later uh, uh, to, to be sort of problematic. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how we fix that uh, a little bit later. So at this point, just keep that in mind. Wow, there's a big barrier in the dummy state uh, and uh, as we sort of move forward. So in the end, um, if we look at the old version of Amber, 
what, uh, what I want you to notice is that if we compare the delta G in aqueous solution and the delta G in the gas phase, notice that, uh, that the unified and split protocols give different answers. However, their difference gives practically the same answer. And this is for the methanol to ethane transformation that I show on top. That's because those two molecules essentially don't change their, their, their conformational ensembles. There's a much, not much of a conformation to change in solution versus the gas phase. However, if we look at the same thing with respect to acetic acid to uh, acid aldehyde transformations, we again see that the delta G, this is with the old version of the code, that the delta G uh, aqueous and delta G gas phase give different results, but their difference definitely give also different results. So that's when the problem really comes up. So after we kind of fix all the bugs and, and, and check things out, everything is now in agreement. Not only do the, the delta G and aqueous and gas phase agree, but the differences of course also agree. So that's all, all straightened up. We also looked at some other things, including variation of the soft core region itself to make sure that our transformations weren't dependent on, on choice of soft core region. And we also compared TI bar and M bar analysis just to show that everything is squared away. So, so uh, we feel uh, very confident that, uh, that the, the, the newest methods that are in AMBER 18 and AMBER 20 uh, are, are very, very internally consistent and, and kind of uh, ready for, for high precision kind of prime time production. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit uh, about what we've done to kind of overhaul the, the soft core potentials. And I'm going to lead right into something that, that we're doing right now, which is a further improvement uh, with respect to the paper that I'm showing here. Okay, so, so the idea here is, uh, is we've recently introduced, uh, encountered some problems, which we've characterized as the, the endpoint catastrophe, the particle collapse problem, and the large chunk problem. This was also a problem that, uh, that uh, Max Ebert and Pauli Butte at uh, CCG had, had encountered and came up with some independent solutions to solve. This was our attempt at, uh, at dealing with those as we encountered them. So the endpoint catastrophe is something that software potentials were originally designed to overcome. The particle collapse problem comes when you have an imbalance between the, the repulsive potentials and electrostatics that favors uh, one atom being completely superimposed on the other. Now that's a, a, a even, it's even more general. They don't have to be completely superimposed. There's other scenarios where, where you can have that type of, of imbalance collapse, but we're, we, we're, we we're calling it particle collapse to give everyone a sense of what it is. Now the large jump problem is, is the counterbalancing problem that occurs uh, sometimes when we try to fix the particle collapse problem by, by retaining a very large repulsion. Uh, so the, the large jump problem occurs in free energy results uh, from sensitivity of the thermodynamic derivatives uh, to certain soft core parameters, in particular uh, uh, the, repuls the repulsions that oftentimes occur uh, most prominently at the end states. So we, we refer to those as, as, as large gradient jump uh, issues. And so the way that we looked into, into solving this uh, was to focus on, on uh, the sort of the lambda scheduling uh, with respect to uh, the use of smooth step soft core potentials. So what we were doing is instead of having a linear transformation uh, involving uh, um, different Leonard Jones and electrostatic terms, we introduced a, a family of smooth step soft core potentials that would allow things to start out with zero gradients so that we could avoid this large gradient jump problem. And then what we did was we rebalanced the, the, the repulsive and electrostatic parameters so that, uh, that we would avoid the particle collapse problem. And yet by having the smooth step soft core functions, we were also able to simultaneously Simultaneously avoid the, the, the large jump problems at the endpoints. This worked pretty good, and I'm going to show you some results. However, as we began testing larger and larger data sets, there were still some, some areas where, where we we're encountering problems. Uh, in our latest variation of this, we introduce a new type of pairwise unis, unitless parameter smooth step soft core potential, and that's in the, in the AMBER uh, drug discovery boost. Uh, and so far, we haven't encountered any problems with it. So we think it's very robust, but we'd like to have other people test it. So I'll go over both of those results real, real briefly right now. So here's uh, the results of the smooth step soft core potentials, that are, which is the new default in AMBER 20. Uh, and I'm using here the classic alpha and beta parameters, where if you notice, the alpha parameters are unitless. And I'm going to switch back to my other slide here. And the beta parameters have, have you know, units of, you know, distance to the m power, which is kind of 
kind of weird, depending on what you choose for your, your scaling factor to the Coulomb charm. Um, and what you end up seeing, here's, here's what I want you to see, is the upper left corner, you see beta equals 12, which was the old default parameter uh, in, uh, in amber. And in particular, the green line there uh, is, has an alpha value of 0.5. So alpha equals 0.5, beta equals 12 used to be the default in amber. And, uh, and that has some problems with these three test cases shown here. You see in, in, in the first test case, we have a very steep rise right at the end. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, for, a, for a, a largely hydrophobic, large steric transformation where we're disappearing these, these three rings. Uh, and also we see that, that it becomes a mess when we have uh, highly charged uh, uh, interactions. The smooth step stop core potential that we introduced with uh, alpha and beta parameters of 0 0.2 and, uh, and, and 50 uh, give everything much better. And you can kind of see with sodium, there's a little, little glip in the bottom right uh, uh, over here, which, uh, which still is indicative of some sensitivity that's, that's not quite uh, perfect. And so that's what we're actually trying to um, further improve. So let me tell you about what we've done most recently, like in the last you know, couple months, uh, is introduce new pairwise unitless parameters where, where uh, it was the formula I showed on the bottom a couple slides ago, uh, where we use smooth step soft core potentials, but we have unitless parameters that are always using the van der Waals sigma ijs in order to, to sort of take into account the specific size. Also, instead of having two different values of, uh, of the exponent, if you remember in the original amber, the, the exponent had, uh, had an n value of, of uh, like two for the electrostatics and, uh, and a, a value of six for the electrostatics. So those two things were being, for, for the, the van der Waals, so those two things were being scaled nonlinearly in a, in, a, in a different way. And that would sometimes cause uh, uh, an imbalance problem. So if those two integers are set to be the same, then what will happen is you will never have the, the same type of particle collapse problem uh, as when those two things are potentially different. So by having uh, the, the, the exponents that, that raise this, this switched off R value, which is also, by the way, made to be rigorously smoothed by the cutoff so that there's no discontinuities across the cutoff boundary, um, we get a lot better results. So, so here we're, we're looking at those same three examples and, and focus on the red line, which, uh, which uh, is the new way that we think is gonna be the best way of doing things that we've discovered so far, not that there aren't other ways that, that, that could be better. And we'd like to have um, people testing this broadly. So we're working with silicon therapeutics, uh, hopefully working with, uh, with uh, Max and Paul to test things out uh, along with other uh, academic uh, and industry collaborators. So if you'd like to be um, one of those and, and want to just check things out, please, uh, please let me know. Um, all right, so another feature in the, the, the kind of uh, drug discovery boost package is we have also the ability to do advanced lambda scheduling. Uh, and so this basically allows us to have separate lambda schedules for different terms of, uh, of the energy involving the, the common core and soft core region. So you can have separate van der Waals, separate electrostatic, separate bonded term scaling, uh, uh, all in accord with, a, with a, a flexible lambda scheduling. And other programs have similar features to this, but now it's available also uh, in AMBER with the, with the drug discovery boost package. Also, all this is cross-compatible with the, the smooth step software functions. Um, we have some uh, attempts at uh, enhanced sampling, which we think are very promising. And I kind of want to go back to that example of, uh, of acetic acid, just to kind of uh, give, uh, give an example of what we're doing in terms of replica exchange using scaling of interactions between arbitrary degrees of freedom. So essentially, we can, we can, we can assign uh, effective temperatures or really just uh, involve scaling parameters for different terms of the energy. And those terms can be the internal energy terms or interaction energy terms between, for example, uh, 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 replicate exchange region and the environment uh, or between uh, a replicate exchange region and itself. So these can be flexibly selected and, uh, and scaling parameters assigned uh, in a way that's, uh, that's quite flexible in, in, in the drug discovery boost package. So I'll give you just an example of, of using that. I'm gonna bring back acetic acid. I'm not gonna explain the details of all the different options that you have. You can uh, read about this later or, or, or I can send it to you. But here's one of the main results. Again, going back to acetic acid because we've already kind of assimilated that a little bit. Um, if we do a gas phase calculation of this and we start the system out in a cis 
configuration or a trans configuration, it basically stays in those configurations. The barrier is too big to get out uh, in the course of say 10 nanoseconds. When we couple uh, that to a replica exchange, where, in, where we're doing replica exchange in kind of an alchemical dimension or alchemical dimension, a dimension where we scale off certain interactions, in particular that, that uh, the, the, the electrostatics and van der Waals, but also that internal torsion angle turn that even in the gas phase when everything's turned off, still gives you, you know, a 6K cal per mole barrier between cis and trans conformations. Once all of those things are turned off, we get interconversion between cis and trans and, uh, and our replica exchange with the arbitrary degrees of freedom is able to sample both states and reproduce the gas phase uh, potential mean force profile. Um, so that's useful. Uh, when we put this into solution, uh, we can also see that, oops, sorry about that. We also see that in solution, uh, after, you know, uh, the, if we look at the, the plot in the bottom left, we see uh, the MD simulation in red on the bottom and uh, the roughly exchange with arbitrary degrees of freedom uh, uh, in the blue. And we notice that, that you know, it's pretty steady, the, the, the read that we're, we're sampling all states all throughout the 10 nanosecond trajectory. Whereas in molecular dynamics, we see a handful of maybe, you know, 10 different jumps between states where we're actually sampling in, in intermediate states. And if we look at the, the resulting PMF profiles, uh, after 10 nanoseconds, uh, the MD still doesn't get very close to the exact PMF, which is computed from umbrella sampling, where the read does. Even after two nanoseconds, the read does pretty good, where, where the, the MD is, is not even close. So we think that that's a potentially a promising uh, uh, interaction. And so now I'm go, going to kind of um, quickly kind of give an overview of the rest. So I'm going to go a little bit faster. Um, I want to talk about uh, uh, our way of doing uh, network-wide analysis of free energies. And uh, here we're using uh, an approach that, that was um, pioneered in, in part by, by Jonah. Uh, involving the fast M-bar method, where instead of solving the traditional M-bar equations that, that you see in, in, in uh, um, Michael and, and, uh, and John's paper on, on, on M-bar, uh, you instead are, are directly variationally optimizing uh, a global a, a convex objective functional that's a, that's a free energy using parameters that are gonna end up being the, the, the M-bar uh, free energy differences between states. Um, here, what we're doing is we have kind of fast way of doing that optimization, but also at the same time applying uh, an arbitrary set of linear constraints. So we can use these constraints to enforce cycle closures or also enforce experimental restraints uh, or restraints to high precision reference values. Oftentimes when doing uh, lead optimization, some of the ligands that you're actually computing uh, have known binding affinities. If you can integrate in that into your analysis as constraints, sometimes that can make things better. I'll show one example here. Here's the CDK. Uh, to data set. Uh, so if we look at the left, we see results where nothing has been restrained. And when we turn on restraints, we see that the correlation actually goes down from 0.69 to 0.65, but the, the mean unsigned error goes down by about a tenth of, the K, of a kcal from about 1 kcal to about 0.9. The mean signed error gets a little bit less, but not a whole lot. What really happens if we, if we choose one ligand that's an outlier, in this case it's called ligand 28, and we enforce that one lig into its experimental value, all of a sudden the correlation goes uh, more like to 0.9, the mean unsigned error goes down to 0.44, and the mean signed error down to, to, to about uh, 0.1 kcal per mole or so. So that made a big difference. It may not always make a big difference, but we think it's a powerful tool to explore this type of thing. And if anyone would like to try it again, uh, we'd be happy to get their feedback. Um, finally, uh, I'll just mention that we have some interesting bookending methods. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go ahead and, and, uh, and now I'm here. So then I'll take a break. Uh, we call it a bookending strategy. And the idea here is if we've gone through the difficult uh, um, exercise of performing uh, alchemical free energy transformations where we're actually changing compounds from one compound to another, like we would in a relative binding free energy calculation. And we want to then correct that from, for example, very fast pairwise additive force field to a polarizable force field or to a quantum mechanical force field or to a machine learning force field, uh, which is more computationally intensive. We don't necessarily need to sample all those fictitious alchemical states in between in order to correct that free energy. We only need to do it at the endpoints. So that's called a, a, a bookending approach. 
There's lots of details to that that I won't go over, but it's been published in this paper. And, uh, and I'll just simply mention, I'm gonna skip through this because uh, of time, uh, just uh, mention that uh, the method that we use that's based on a bar approach, which requires one, only one endpoint simulation using the high level reference. And it can be multiple simulations that are pretty short. Uh, we feel that uh, we have a method that's fairly robust because we have to do one simulation at that high level endpoint, it's not as fast as if we didn't have to do such a simulation, but we're continuing to work on that uh, and, and uh, try to eliminate that simulation altogether. But we can have a simulation at, uh, at uh, the, 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 the reference state and one simulation at the high level state, and we're able to span that gap uh, with only those two endpoints using a bar approach. Uh, if we use uh, what's called a reference potential that allows us to get closer to our high level quantum picture. And so that's what the, 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 the curve up, the, up in the right hand corner is showing is the results of, uh, of, of that method. That's called BBQM. Um, finally, I'd like to, to acknowledge a uh, uh, great ongoing collaboration with uh, Woody Sherman and coworkers. We recently um, have online a, a, a review paper in JCIM about alchemical binding for energy calculations in Amber 20, including best practices. And, uh, and here we, we, we take a look at uh, some ca comparisons involving uh, uh, large data sets that have been published in the literature and uh, with, uh, with the methods that we've been using and using off the shelf GAF2, uh, we're able to get mean signed errors that are comparable with a lot of the other published approaches in the literature. So we're very happy about that and hopefully things are just gonna go uh, up from there as we continue to improve the methods and force fields. Um, so again, we'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Woody Sherman and coworkers. I'll, I'll, this is a shout out to them. Uh, they, they've really been test driving a lot of the stuff that we've, we've built and have some exciting results uh, that I don't have time to talk about. Uh, but, I, but I point your attention to, to Woody and coworkers work uh, in that area. And I'd like to thank all of you, the funding agencies and our collaborators uh, for supporting this work. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Darren. Thanks for that great presentation. Uh, we're running into our, our uh, break period, so I'll just ask uh, one or two questions. So uh, Christopher Bailey asks, uh, will the SSC improvements change simulation mapping of ligands by making formerly pathological edges now acceptable or even good? I think it's a great question. So far, out of all the tests that, that we've done, the answer is we haven't found a case yet. And yet, um, I can't emphasize enough the need for, for broader testing, beta testing, and, and feedback. We learn so much when someone finds something that we just haven't looked at. So I don't have a great answer for, for, uh, for you, Chris, but so far, we haven't encountered any, but we're still looking. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, well, with that, there's no more questions. So we'll go ahead and uh, begin our break. Thank you, Darren. And I'd like to thank uh, all of the speakers from this morning. So Christina Lingle and uh, Darren for their wonderful talks um, and all of our attendees who could come and, and participate with us. So we will begin our break and we'll break until uh, half of the hour. So 1.30 in Eastern Standard, Eastern Standard Time. Thanks so much. And we'll see you at 1.30 or half of the hour, wherever you may live. Thanks. Thanks.